This is the Last Minute Blues Podcast with Donnie Fandango, Jeff Burton, Alex Ferrario, and former Blues defenseman Jamie Rivers. It is the Last Minute Blues Podcast joined in studio by Jeremy Rutherford from The Athletic and Alex Ferrario from 101 ESPN. Gentlemen, hello, how are you? And I am so happy today. Because it is going to be 37 friggin' degrees. That's not, where, that's not where I thought he was going with it. I thought he was going to say, hello, how are you? I'm so happy today because the Bills won. I'm still happy. About that. <laughs> I, I, I am still happy, but I am also, I am more happy that I'm going to be able to go out to my car after I get out of the air, or off the air today, and my fingers won't be freezing as I'm walking but to the car. But seriously, you got to be more excited that it's going to be 37 than that Blues win, right? I mean, this is the number one thing in the world that it is not one degree outside. It, 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 wait, wait, I the am. Bills win. Blues, Blues haven't won in the last two, JR. F- first of all, <laughs> oh, did I say Blues? You said oh, Blues. I meant to say Bills. If the Bills continue to win, we could live in some kind of subarctic whatever the heck, and I would just Kansas City. friggin' deal with it. You know what I'm saying? I Guys, listen. Yes. I'm not going to turn this into this. Yes. But there is very few things in my universe right now that I despise, despise as much as the Kansas City Chiefs and their freaking fan base. And I don't want to talk too much garbage because I feel like when I do, it adversely affects my team. Karma. All right? Yeah. 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 Well. But everywhere I go this week, in St. Louis, I will have something Buffalo on me that is visible. (laughs) Every time I take the trash out and I have a neighbor that lives catty corner from me and has one of those things next to his door that says Mahomes, Mahomes by the door. All right, That's lame. Every time I take the trash out, I got my shirt on or a hat and I'm looking over there. I'm waiting for it. Come on, say something to me. Something I, need to, I need to throw snowballs at the house just so they look at you. And he's pr- if I could, I freaking would. <laughs> Alex, when I tweet the the uh, the podcast here later today on yeah. Twitter, I'll do a uh, Chiefs Kingdom. Yeah, I was going to say hashtag Chiefs Kingdom. <laughs> That's how you get kicked off the podcast. Yeah, and you know what? The worst part is so okay. So you know you know learn uh, yeah. learn from from the point and used to be Casey, one of my favorite human beings on the planet. Her husband Tim is. We, which who we Chiefs worked at, massive cheese fan, and one of my favorite human beings on the planet. <laughs> like I love him so much that it hurts my heart. And I think that like he kind of asked me to watch the game with him on Sunday, but the last game that we watched together was a Blue Stanley Cup game where they got housed against Boston. I think it was like oh, game yeah. two or game three, and they lost like seven to one or seven to two. Probably the one my dad paid like three thousand dollars to go to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not smart. <laughs> we had a party that night, and. Uh, uh, the party got pretty quiet yeah. pretty early on. That's, that's how those go. <laughs> but 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 then also too, they they, they the, the NFL it, they do this to me. So I'm an early riser, man. Like I don't sleep in hardly ever. Since my kids indoctrinated me with getting up super early, <laughs> however long ago, I just get up. So Sunday is going to be the longest day of all time <laughs> waiting for 6.30. Tony's going to be sitting in his Bills clothes Saturday afternoon waiting for Sunday to get here. If I would not stink, I would do that. <laughs> Man, and I take this too seriously. <laughs> I, 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 I cannot. I don't know what it is about this team, but I, I take these wins and these losses so hard. It when they lose this Kansas City thing, like this is the time to friggin' beat them. That, that we're on a roll. I they don't think Kansas City is as good as they have been previously. <laughs> I think that this is the time, yeah. but we also have 74 injuries, which I'm completely freaking <laughs> concerned about as well. You can't really tell that he wears it on a sleeve, no, though. No, not at all. Look, I'm I'm going to be the biggest Bills fan this week because I don't want to hear my co-host BK talk about the Chiefs. So I've already converted to uh, Bill Billalithism. I Thank just made you. that a religion. I love so, that. You're welcome. I love BK so much, but when he starts talking about the Chiefs, and I'll say this to him on his show, when he starts talking about the Chiefs, he gets so snotty. It's so it's the so Chiefs. It's so, he also talks about the Cardinals and the Blues and the NFL. Snooty. No, but when he talks about those other things, I'm locked in. I love it. I I I learn. A, I love BK for real. For real, he's one of my very favorite people on the radio in St. Louis. That dude knows his business. But when he talks about the Chiefs, it's almost like I can see. His, his like his pinky, pinky finger up. raise oh, up, yeah. rise up like there's like there's something like so proper about about Chiefs Kingdom and all this. <laughs> <laughs> One thing is for sure: Tuesday, he's either going to be insufferable in the good way, or he's not going to speak. 
we might have to be leading the podcast on Tuesday. <laughs> well, it, well, I, 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 I mean, you know, you, you recover see, the, fast. The, the thing is, though, is that this season has been such an emotional roller coaster that I did not feel like we would be here to to and be playing the Chiefs in the second round of the so playoffs. You know, after that Eagles game, man. I was wrecked. Like, I was re- That hurt my soul. And so when they, you, you know, since they've been on the run, I have very much enjoyed it, but I also keep in mind how the season started. And, you know, man, as you watch your team, whether your team is super great or not, you're always picking things that, you know need to be better that can be better you know like Gabe Davis dressing for this game on Sunday I wonder when what pass he's going to drop that he should catch for a touchdown <laughs> that sort of thing you know but it's just uh, God I just want this so bad so bad like so so bad I don't drink if the Bills would would win the Super Bowl I would get absolutely ass house I want to be there I do too can I, we have a Super Bowl party well you know what you, you know what you guys both live n- ish near me in South County, sort of. So, like, there's a chance I might be running by your house shirtless oh, after fantastic. that sort of thing happens. <laughs> I might need to come in and warm up. I don't know. So, no, uh, you're a Bills fan. You're good. All right. So, gentlemen, uh, th- one of the things and how I wanted to start this is one, one of the things that we've been talking about since Drew Bannister took over our Blues is that it seems like there has been a buttoning up of in a lot of different areas. I's are dotted, T's are crossed. Attention is paid to detail, and, and you, you, we feel like we've been seeing that on the ice. I feel like in maybe the last few games that that sort of attention to detail has maybe not been there as much. Is there, you know, is that sort of a honeymoon with the new coach sort of coming to a bit of an end and we're starting to maybe get a little taste of reality again, or maybe I'm overthinking this. Talk to me, guys. Well, I think it's inevitable that at some point, whether it's two weeks, three weeks, you know, kind of that honeymoon uh, happens and, and I th- that it's over. Uh, I think that we were talking to Drew Bannister about that, Alex, uh, the first week or two that he was here was saying, hey, how how do you get past that honeymoon? How do you sustain it? How do you keep playing? Well, you got to create good habits. And I think the Blues have created a lot of good habits. Um, we all know the success. What are they up to now? Like nine and five, yeah, I think. I think so. Uh, since Drew Bannister took yeah, over. They were so, five, four, and one in these last ten. Yeah, so the success has been there maybe you know, not as much the past couple games. But I, I still think, like you said, he's instilling that, detail in their game and for the most part uh, up until recently they've been executing that but there's just too many colossal mistakes here lately that's costing them the game and I heard um, you know some analysis the past couple days about how you know the blues and this is what teams become guilty of just trying to do too much in certain spots and I think we saw that with Tori Krug the other night with what under 20 seconds left to go in that period you know just get the puck behind yeah. the other team and let's deal with it another day and instead it's in the back of the net and that kind of sets the tone for the third period so there's been a few mistakes like that I think that have overshadowed the progress that they've made I also think Drew Bannister is just getting the best out of what they've got right now yeah like I do feel like that the they're in a position where they don't have a ton of offensive guys right now you've got some guys who are going through it some guys who just can't provide the offense that you thought they could provide defensively it does feel like what JR mentioned where you're trying to force the issue and you're looking at these games that's two to one and you're thinking we got to start scoring some more points. And so you try and get a little bit more aggressive. But the problem is the aggressiveness turns into turnovers. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, it's, it's like watching a team that feels like they're starting to get their mojo back, but then they get kind of knocked back into reality. That's like, well, you're not there yet. And mm-hmm. the only way this team's going to win hockey games are how they won against Colorado and Vancouver. Like you're going to have to score two or three goals and be comfortable with that. You got the goaltending that can do it, but the only way you're going to be able to accomplish those victories is if you play boring hockey. And the problem is when you take on teams like Philadelphia, when you take on teams like Boston, they don't want to wait around for your boring hockey. Mm-hmm. They're going to they're going to create stuff to happen themselves, which then the Blues get forced into that, okay, well, now we got to start creating, but next thing you know, you're turning the puck over. So it's, I, I mean... Things get to be things get to to start to 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 be a little nerve wracking to me when we start trying to do the uh, the run and gun playing uh, for the other team's yeah. pace. Yeah, You're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, guys, uh, this is not going to not going to work here. What about the shots on goal the last few games? Seems like it has been a whole heck of a lot, and I know you know that could be a misnomer sometimes. You know what I'm saying? The the, the number of shots on goal. Are you guys alarmed by that at all? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's an ebb and flow statistic that happens throughout the season. You know, you can play decent hockey. Like, shoot, they won the Ranger game, right? Yeah. Getting out shot 42 to 21. So, so you know, it, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but I think that, Donnie, what the Blues are doing, which we just talked about, leads to that statistic being the way it is. So uh-huh. so when you cough up the puck, you don't make the right play at the right moment, now all of a sudden it's coming back into your zone. And I, I don't think they've been as good defensively. Uh, in their own zone, and 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 so now it get, leads to a lot of offensive zone possession time for the other team, and then thus two or three shots on goal per visit down there, and then the Blues are getting up ice, and it's it's a one and done situation. So over the course of the game, it's going to be forty two to twenty one. So yeah, you look at it, what thirty five to twenty three, forty two to twenty one. Yeah. The last three games, it hasn't been great. That said, I think the shots that they've been getting have been pretty good. And and I thought the goalies Carter Hart especially there and Alex I mean that game could have been one one two one Blues, uh, but Carter Hart with a couple big saves so yeah that number it doesn't look good right now they definitely need to increase the shot total yeah I mean look when you took on Shesterkin with the Rangers you beat him pretty easily with those shots and that's the talent that the Blues have but also remember in that game Jordan Cairo scored the hat trick for you so could have like had six or seven yeah seriously he was like lights out in that game that seems to be where the Blues are at even if the shots aren't up there high. It's the conversion of those shots, but it seems to only be coming from those top guys. I, those shots on goal also, it's it's just the passing. It's it's the always looking for that extra pass that's like, oh, well, I have this opportunity to shoot it, and I'll go back to that Rangers game. Now, I know Kyru had a hat trick and almost could have had seven goals, but that first play where he had the puck on his stick, he had the shot, decided to pass it instead, and it didn't go his way. Now, he went back to just shooting the puck and looked how it worked, but like I go to that last game that they just lost, and who was it that had 10 shots on goal? Owen Tippett. Owen Tippett. 10 yeah. shots on goal. Like, that's a team. Boston's also a team. Colorado of plays this way man they don't care where the shots are coming from they're just going to shoot it Mm -hmm. because one they're going to get a face off if it's just a harmless shot that the goaltender is going to save and for how good you've been in faceoffs this season, I think the Blues would want that more. But two, you you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if it bounces off of somebody awkwardly. And, and I think right now it feels like, one, they're not winning those board battles. And Steve Ott told Curbs and Joey this uh, the other night after that loss to Philly. Like, we, we just weren't winning any board battles. But he also basically said, like, we need to invest in net front presence. And some of the reason you're not getting those shots on goal is, it's because there's nobody around. And if it's just a harmless shot, I don't think the Blues want to take that right. one. Once you start getting guys that are willing to go to the front of the net, that's where more of those shots start to just pile up. All right, so I'm going to say this, and this is not sexy, and this is not awesome, and you're and people are going to go, duh. But this is more of what we would expect to see from a team that's A, still finding its way, B, is in this mid re tool thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's just, I mean, it's what we see. We see some good, we see some bad, and it all seems to kind of sort of even out. It's a 500 club. Yeah, that's the thing, and I think Drew Bannister said it best a week or so ago where he said, the reason we're having success here is we're playing patient hockey, we're playing the system, we're doing things, you know, at the pace that we need to, to do them, mm-hmm. and when we get playing impatient hockey is when we're going to make, the, well, guess what the definition of patient hockey is? It's boring. Yeah, right? yeah, and, yeah. And, and I think that's what we've seen, especially when you don't see the offense, and you know, I don't want to rain on the parade here here but this this is the question you asked and I'll just say it is you know Alex made a comment a minute ago where he said you know you're just not there yet you know when the Blues get to there where they're a good team again these guys on the roster here aren't going to be here I mean they're they're placeholders they're placeholders right now with the Kapanen's and the you know Verano when he was here even a Brandon Saad you know a lot of these guys just aren't going to be here when the Blues get to that point so you know, enjoy that you have an NHL team. Enjoy that. <laughs> enjoy that yeah. uh, they can win and beat some good teams. Uh, but you know, they're building in that direction. But all I think that Blues fans probably want to care about right now is the building of these core guys that are going to be here in three or four well, years. Well, and Jr., you had it in your athletic piece, the survey that you're doing with fans, asking if this is better or worse or what you expected from the Blues team. And uh, once the results come out, I know you said you peaked at it, and a lot of people feel like it's exactly what you thought it was going to be yeah like I I had the I had the impression at least from Doug Armstrong at the beginning of the season that the team felt like they were trending in the right direction maybe a cusp playoff team well they're four points away from a playoff spot right now in the Western Conference I also felt like that you know it probably is going to look pretty a lot of the times and you might be selecting in the top 10 you're two points away from being the sixth overall pick in the National Hockey League draft so like where this stands right now is exactly what I thought it was going to be. The difference is 
the Western Conference hasn't been playing great. Now, they're starting to heat up. Edmonton, Seattle, you've got your top teams. But the Blues are a 500 club, and they've kept pace with everybody else in that Western Conference, which is exactly what I thought they were going to be this year. Yeah, Donnie, I told Alex, uh, spoiler alert, we're doing the Blues fan survey, and one of the questions is, uh, are the Blues better, worse, or about the same as where you thought they would be at this point? And uh, I looked at the, the voting, and we still got a couple days left in the voting, so we'll get a final tally here in a few days. But right now it's running about 72% where people said this is about where I thought they'd be. So I think that's a prevailing thought. Yeah. Let, oh, so ahead. I was just going to say, let's do this test real quick then. So, like, what if we were to break it up into individual areas? If you were saying the goaltender, better, worse, or what you expected, how would you vote it? I think it's been a little bit better than I would have expected. I, I think Bennington's been great. I think Hofer, even though he doesn't, he hasn't won every night, yeah. I think for a rookie, he's been good, and I think the tandem has been above average in my book. I mean, I would I would say the same. I mean, I came in with high expectations, but there's been multiple nights where it's been either Bennington or Hofer that saved the bacon, as it yeah. were. And defensively, would you say better or worse or what you expected? Yeah, leaps better. Yeah. Oh, dude, I mean, definitely better. And, and the part that I would say is worse than I expected was the offense. But I also think that was because I had those blinders on in the final 20 games of the season last year where Verona was playing in your top six. I mean, Verona was playing with Pavel Buchnevich as a centerman last year. So it's no coincidence that, yeah, he found offense last season. You had uh, Sammy Blay playing in your top nine who was scoring goals. Yeah. Like, I I, we were at least I was under the impression that the offense was going to have multiple guys pushing 30 goals. This is a part that kind of surprised me that you weren't getting that type of contribution from the offense. But if you were to tell me that at the beginning of the season, that hey, your goaltender is going to be better than what you expected, your defense is going to be night and day better than what you expected. I'd be on board with all of those if you told me my offense was going to be bad. And 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 the reason that 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 we're okay with that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is because we're staring down the pipe of the Dvorskis and the Snuggerudes and hasn't um, uh, Zach, Zachary Bolduc hasn't Zachary he been yeah. heated up in Springfield? So theoretically, fingers crossed, we've got that coming. Yeah. And the offense is there. It's the defense that you were concerned about and how that was going to look. Well, and also, too, and speaking of the defense, man, how about Matt Kessel? <laughs> Friggin' coming in here and, like, securing himself a spot on the back end there. And, I mean, sort of kind of putting Tyler Tucker uh, up in the press box he's, with what he's he done. He still has not been on the ice for an even strength goal against. Think wow. about that. Yeah, yeah. And, and Kessel... You watch him, Alex and I, I've mentioned this before, sit next to each other, and, and you watch Kessel, and it's nothing flashy. It's just that he knows where to be, and he makes simple plays. And, and all he's of a sudden, big. Yeah, and he's big, and all of a sudden the puck's out of the zone. So, so hey, listen, anybody who's been following the Blues the past couple of years heard the Kessel na name and knew that he was in Springfield and knew he was a pretty good minor league player. But at, at this point, we'd only seen him play the one or two uh, NHL right. games, and now you get a stretch of him. You know, what does it say that he's in the top four, and then <laughs> now you're scratching a Marco Scandel which I get he's going to be a free agent and you're likely to move on from him uh, and their right shot, left shot. This is a big thing with Drew Bannister. He wants the the, the right shot Kessel out there, uh, but he's held his own. Like if he couldn't play, he wouldn't be out there, right? right? Regardless of what shot he was, right or left, but but he's been great. So I don't know if you go as far as saying that Matt Kessel will be in your top six starting lineup next year at this point, but I think he's put his name into that conversation. Let me read this text from uh, Ryan Smith, who's the play-by-play -play guy for the Thunderbirds, because when they called up Kessel back in December, I was curious kind of what he's seen from him, because we only saw like, what, three games last year with him? He said when he's at his best, he plays a a very simple game north and south big body who can use his frame when called upon but won't get himself out of position to make a hit he's got a great shot when he needs to use it but definitely a defensive first mindset and that was in the minors with drew banister and then drew banister brings him up and not only tells him we need you to be a defensive minded guy but we're going to play you with tory krug and he and Tory Krug, again, were only on the ice for one even strength goal against, and Kessel wasn't even playing with Krug at the time. It was Krug and Scandella. So those two guys against Boston, not Boston, uh, Vancouver, Colorado, Carolina, Florida, when you lost 5-1, to one, mind you, Pareko and Letty are going up against those other teams' top lines. But 
Matt Kessel and Tori Krug are going up against the team's second best line. So like that Vancouver game, they went up against Elias Pettersson's line because the the top pair got the JT Miller line. Pettersson didn't have a point in that game. Carolina, he went up against that Kat- Katka Niemi line. I know, it was terrible. <laughs> don't, try, me. don't try and get me to spell it because that's <laughs> not going to happen. They didn't have a point in that game. Colorado, when he went up against that Ryan Johansson line, they didn't have a point in that game. So like... Kessel and Krug, when they are appearing, it's part that's kind of frustrated me these last couple of games. And I know you got to get Falk that ice time, but man, when you've got Tory Krug playing the way that he was playing with Matt Kessel, I don't know if I break those pairings up, even if Justin Falk is healthy. And Matt Kessel is to correct me if I'm wrong. Matt Kessel is the guy that when we're not hearing his name during the game, yeah. and you go through the entire game and know that you know maybe you just heard his name a couple times, he yeah. had a good game. Carl yeah. Gunderson esque. <laughs> right, right. You know, the the less that he's mentioned, kind of yeah. the less that he's out there, the more he's kind of doing his gig. Like I don't think the feistiness is there, and maybe it will get there the more comfortable he is. But he plays a very similar style than what Joel Edmondson used to play. Mm-hmm. Big, wouldn't let you around him, and when you did try and get around him, he'd put the body on you. Yeah, and you look at the future. You know, he could be that third pair guy uh, yeah. on the on the right side, and obviously can play middle pair if you if you need that so i think this is a great fifth round pick you know that they've uh, developed and banister has faith in him you know banister is the coach this is a guy a relationship that they've created where they can trust each other i think it says the world like i would have never guessed that matt kessel would have stayed in the lineup when everybody was healthy but uh, he's played his way into that and it's so amazing to me and impressive that you know you've got a fifth rounder and kessel making a difference what what, what was tucker wasn't tucker he was seventh, a seventh rounder, a seventh rounder. Yeah, yeah. you know like if you're a Blues fan and you're looking for things to be thankful that you have, you have a scouting department that seemingly is friggin' on the is on the ball and is on the screws and is able to find guys like this because that was for me and obviously this is a much different comparison that I'm trying to make but like um you know Detroit didn't they find like Zetterberg in like the third yeah, round or yeah, something stupid fourth, like yeah. that like, Dotsuk was like in the hundredth round or something <laughs> see you know what I mean yeah. but you're you're finding those gems and it seems as though and again not to that degree I understand <laughs> but you're still you're finding. NHL players maybe a little bit later than you thought you would. For sure, and different type of players, too. So if you look at, let's look at three of the young guys on defense. You have a Perinovich. Yeah, he's smaller, but he's a puck mover. He can run your power play. You have Kessel, who's a, you know, I'm not going to make any mistakes. Uh, you're not going to notice me, but I'm going to get you through the game yeah. guy. And then you have a Tyler Tucker. Okay, you want me to fight Brady Kachuk? All right, <laughs> let's do it. Let's get <laughs> right, game on. Right. So, so they have different types of guys coming up the pipeline. I know Perinovich has been here a couple years, but different types of guys who can step in for whatever you And you, you got need. that little Theo Lindstein, too. Too, who's another offensive minded guy who just was at the World Juniors that they're pretty excited about. So, I mean, you got a lot of that going on in your system. All right. So, uh, we have seen a very good year so far from Tory Krug. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody that um, the Blues tried to trade in the offseason didn't work. All right. He refused it. In this coming up offseason, is he a guy that the Blues are going to look to potentially maybe move again? Yeah, I think that they're going to try to do something. I think that they have, uh, you know, we, we know that they're in a retool. We know that they want to play some younger guys and move them in and see what they can get, whether that's Perinovich, whether that's Kessel, whoever it is. And Doug Armstrong, he's always doing it, so it's not like he's going to start this offseason. But, you know, he's going to explore, okay, what's the market for Krug? You know, where's a team that he would approve a trade to? Same with probably Nick Letty. And the name I'll throw out there, too, is, you know, what about Justin Falk? I don't think yep. that you just exclude him from any talk in terms of trades. Not saying that the Blues are going to trade yeah. him, but – if you got guys up and coming like a Kessel who can play that spot, um, you know I think that maybe you can get something for a, a Justin Falk and you can continue to replenish this retool. I, you need leaders around. You want to win. You want to be competitive. But if you can't move a Tory Krug, if there's not a home for him, you know you got to look to do something. I think the biggest goal if you're Doug Armstrong is cap flexibility right now, especially if you're trying to just maneuver through this this window of 5,500 hockey. You're trying to open up a little bit more cap flexibility. Uh, and JR, you asked the question and said, like, you know, some of these guys aren't going to be a part of the, the solution in three years when they're ready to compete. If you look at that defense, I could point to one guy, maybe two guys that I feel like would be a part of the solution when they're ready to compete. It's Pareko and for the way that Matt Kessel has just played. I'm not sure Letty's in that conversation. I'm not sure Scandell is in that conversation. Uh, Krug or a Justin Falk. And I think a Justin Falk is because Matt Kessel's played this well. I think a Tory Krug is because Scott Perunovich has shown and stayed healthy. But I also think that this Theo Lindstein has given the Blues an opening up their eyes a little bit more of, 
hey, we might have another smaller stature but puck-moving defenseman. And as we've seen, they don't like to have all of those guys in the lineup at the same time. Well, and I think one of uh, one of the things we've seen the last couple of years is when there is a legit player on the trade market, boy, oh, boy, it seems like the trader can, I don't want to say fleece the tradee, but boy, oh boy, you get a lot in return when you're moving somebody that is kind of this known quantity. And not that I want to see them move Falk or anything like that, but boy, oh boy, yeah. you think the return on that would be something else. What about a guy like Marco Scandell at the trade deadline? Yeah. What do you think we get for that guy? Well, I think he's a guy who could be traded. I think there would be some interest, you know, especially because you know a couple of years ago he had so much term left on right. his contract, people aren't looking at, at Marco Scandella. But now that he's in the final year, I mean, to be a six, even a seventh guy for a playoff team, you know, playoff teams are always saying, "Hey, we need nine or ten defensemen for the run." I, I don't. I think teams would be good to have a Marco Scandella on their roster heading through the playoffs. Um, and I think you know the Blues aren't can't expect much. I mean, that's going to be maybe third, fourth round pick okay. uh, to get a Marco Scandella. So he's not going to yield you much in terms of the return there. But definitely, that's something I think the Blues would okay. consider. It Just, is going to be very interesting this trade deadline. Sixth round pick that was traded. Uh, to St. Louis, or from St. Louis to Anaheim when they traded for Michael Delzato in 2019. Would you say that they're kind of on the same level? Because Delzato was traded for as like a eighth defenseman. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe thirds a little too. Maybe it's a fourth, but I, I think some more of the middle yeah. rounds. Yeah. What, wasn't that? Uh, wasn't I totally forgot about that guy? Wasn't Delzato like a model or something? Or like uh, <laughs> I think like, he was married to a, or dating he, a model. He thought he was. Yeah. A model. Well, uh, maybe that was it. As I much mean, as anything. Just <laughs> ask. Yeah. It was. There was walking around a lot with no shirt on in the locker room, but that to make sense. It's so funny though, man, because Jr. <laughs> Jr. Just doing his job brings up uh, brings up Falk and and. I look at him as he's saying that, and it's almost like he's breaking my heart. Like, like, and I know, punch you, and I know that how this is how it's going to work, and how it's supposed to go, and what we want. (laughs) But man, like the fan in me is like, oh no, 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 keep him, please, no, please, dude, that's (laughs) exactly right. The same tone and everything. See, here's the thing, though. Like when you talk about how like the trader seems to get a lot more than than what you would imagine for certain players, depending on who they are and how they're playing. The other thing, too, is I don't know how many sellers there are going to be at this year's deadline because everybody's so freaking close together. Yeah. Like, we were just talking about this off of the air. Edmonton and Seattle might push into a playoff spot. They might move into second and third in the Pacific, which moves L.A. and Vegas down into a wild card spot. So that means Nashville and Arizona are fighting for a wild card spot, and I would imagine Minnesota's going to get there as well. I, I mean, that's... That's all but like four teams in the Western Conference that are pushing for a playoff spot. How many sellers are really going to be out there that are willing to trade away pieces if they're two, three, four points out of the playoffs? That's why the Blues are in an interesting spot because the Blues might be four points out of a playoff spot. They might be six points out of a playoff spot. But Doug Armstrong is a very honest man, and he looks at his team and says, can this team do damage? And, and and also, to be clear on the Falk front, is this. Look, we, we just talked about the holes up front they have, right? And, yeah. you know, uh, Kapanen would likely be gone. Verona be gone. You know, you could trade Saad at the deadline. Yeah. The Blues are going to have to replenish that somehow. The Dvorskis, the Snuggerudes, those guys, you know, they might be ready soon, but is it next year? We don't know yet. Uh, so the Blues are going to have to make some deals or sign somebody. But the free agent market, you know, can be expensive. So maybe trade's uh, more likely. So if you can trade, let's say, a Krug or a Falk off that defense to uh, – bring in a forward and then you plug in a Perinovic on a full-time basis or a Kessel to come in and play that defense. Um, that said, the types of trades that involve players like Falk with a couple years term left on their deals usually aren't until the off season. So I, I don't yeah. know that we'll see a Falk traded at the deadline, but you could see one of those veteran D guys, Letty Falk Krug, uh, maybe moved in the off season. Yeah. All right, a few things here real quick, uh, NHL-wise. Uh, one, I saw that uh, Marc-Andre Fleury, the flower, passed Patrick Waugh for all-time – was it all-time wins? Number two. Yeah, number Num- two. Number, so number Marty two Rodeur is still number, number one. one. Like 691 or something like that. <laughs> I, and, and, I, and I'm sorry to say this, and I'm sorry to admit this. I probably shouldn't, but I w- was truly not aware that his numbers – were what they are. Yeah. And by all accounts, everything I read about that guy, he is loved <laughs> in the locker room. And then, I mean, he's obviously a fan favorite. That's really something else for this guy. And he could be on the block at the uh, uh, yeah. uh, trade deadline, depending on what Minnesota's doing. Yeah, I, I, 
I, hearing Joe tell the stories about Flurry because they played together in Pittsburgh, he seems like he's probably one of the coolest guys to be around because he's always playing pranks on guys. He's always kind of keeping guys on their toes. And I saw one of the Minnesota Wild player put a post out following that victory the other night that got him that win and said, like, he not only did what he did, but he did it with a smile on his face. Like, have you ever seen Mark andre Flurry do an interview where he was pissed off? Even after losses, the dude seems like he's smiling. So that's a huge accomplishment. Now, what's wild about it and Curbs brought this to my attention, thinking about what Patrick Waugh did and Marty Brodeur did without the shootouts. Because remember, like, there used to be ties. Yeah. There was no shootouts where you'd win or lose. It was ties. So, like, it's great what Flurry did, but imagine winning as many games as Marty Brodeur did where it's win, lose, or tie. Patrick Waugh, win, lose, or tie. Like, that means they're winning them in regulation or overtime. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Flowers is one of the best ever in terms of teammates. David Prawn's another guy who who sings his praises. Oh yeah. So, and, and imagine this too. You know, if you're Mike Andre Fleury, you grew up up there in in French Quebec, and those are your two idols, Marty Brodeur and uh, and um, Patrick, Patrick Wah. Wah. Yeah. And and so to pass Wah with all that, I don't want to say pressure, but just knowing who he was and the legend that he was, to be able to surpass him the other night was pretty epic. Hey, and real quick, this reminds me of a. a a 10 second funny story uh marty birder when he worked for the st louis blues sometimes he'd go on the road trips and one time there was about four of us on a uh a dinner we went out for dinner had some pizza and you guys have all been there before you know how when you order pizza and there's 10 slices and three or four of you are eating there's always that one piece that sits there uh for like three hours <laughs> and, and nobody touches it while you drink your beers you know for, for three Everybody hours looks at the other yeah. guy like, yeah. you're gonna eat it i don't want to um, be the one to take yeah. the last one right. the waitress comes and they say no 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 don't take it one of us is gonna finish it <laughs> Yeah, don't, they, try yeah. To, they try to take it like three or four yeah. times. I'm putting my arm it's up and everything. It's a threat at the yeah. table. No, somebody yeah. is going to eat it. And so at the end of the night, I think there's like uh, three of us. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. I think there's like three of us sitting there, and Marty happens to be one of them. So fortunate to be able to, you know, every once in a while go out to dinner. And uh, we're putting our coats on. We're standing up. We're starting to walk towards the door, and I grab that last piece. All of a sudden, Marty puts his arm around me. Goes, I knew it was going to be you. I knew it was going to be you. <laughs> Dude, that is so awesome. Like, dude, that's that's such an amazing interaction. But then also you had that interaction with freaking Martin Brodeur. That's freaking amazing, man. Marty knew you were going to eat the pizza. Dude, that's so fantastic. Uh, so, and what, and like also too, I love the videos where like, and, and, and there was one that was posted a couple of months ago where Flower, or, 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 or Flower like got a kid out of social studies class or something or like gave him a little video to, <laughs> to excuse him out of social studies or something. Just seems like an absolutely fantastic yeah. dude and an easy guy to root for. Um, I have been reading a bunch. Uh, I told you guys, and I've told you a bunch before, I'm obsessed with the Toronto Maple Leafs. And so one of the things that I keep reading in the course of the last week or so is that is that Sheldon Keefe might be on the hot seat up there in Toronto. If you're Craig Berube, would you want that job? Oof. So, yeah, somebody asked me this question That's a, a good day question. or two ago. I think it's a good question because I do think that he could be, you know, a guy that could help that team. I guess my only thing is this. Craig Berube, I know he coached in Philly, but he still strikes me, like he said on the way out the door, as this blue-collar, hard-working yeah. You know, play that type of style, and I just don't know that he's the right match for those guys for and exactly what they need. And then you throw Toronto into it; it's it, you know, it's the corporate. You know, not that the hockey's not the the biggest thing it is, but you know, I think that's why he related to Philadelphia. That's why he relates to St. Louis because yep. that's the type of coach he is. The thing too, like as a Canadian, you'd think Craig Berube would want to would say like, yeah, I could turn this team around. And imagine being the first coach that gets that team at Stanley Cup or hell, even gets the team to the Eastern Conference Final. That's an achievement in itself. Uh, but like, it, can can Craig Berube get Austin Matthews and William Nylander to commit to a team the way that he got Alexander Steen to commit to a team or Vladimir Tarasenko to commit. I, I don't know if he can, and that's the hard part. Like, And I'm not sure that's – I'm sure that's what every coach has to go through with that team. So, I mean, if you're Barubi, it's got to be in the back of your head. Like, yeah, I could find a way to get this to work in Toronto. You still have really good pieces – but, man, I think if I'm him, I wait until that field opens up more. I wait until there's more teams available. I'm going to wait till the off season and say, like, let's see what this landscape looks like. If Brendan Moore doesn't come back to Carolina, that's a blue-collar mentality team that would match. Um, it, it really, like, there's other teams like New Jersey. If the Devils don't have success with Lindy Ruff, do they bounce him and bring somebody else in? That Or the Islanders. The Islanders are another one that would be interesting if they decide to move on because they're a – 
defensive-minded team. I'm not sure Toronto is where Craig Burby wants to continue in. Sure. Guys, this is probably at least the third or fourth time over the course of the last six, eight weeks in which we've been talking about coaching coaching changes various ways, and, and you've mentioned – Brenda Moore and Carolina in his contract. What's going on there? And if you're the Hurricanes, why aren't you locking this dude up? Because it's apparent to, like, anyone that watches hockey that he's freaking phenomenal. And the team loves him. That's the part that's surprising to me. So what's going on? Anytime you don't go into a year with a contract on pending guys, it makes me very nervous. Maybe I just have PTSD with so many guys in St. Louis that that's happened with. But... uh, uh, tinfoil theory here. I, I wonder if it's because Carolina knows Brendan Moore's not going to go anywhere else. I mean, Brendan Moore's made it pretty clear, like, he's only wanting to coach in Carolina. Now, does that change when Carolina says, nope, we don't want you anymore, and you, you have that itch still? I wonder, but if you're Carolina, you got to be thinking, well, Brendan Moore's going to want to be back, but you also want to see if we have success because as great as he is, it's been bounced in the first round, bounced in the second round. I don't think they've gotten to the Eastern Conference Finals since Brendan Moore has been there, so I'm sure you're you're thinking because it seems to be the way it goes in the NHL. After about three to four years, if you don't have success, you're gone. Maybe that's where Carolina's thinking, like, yeah, let's see what this looks like. Yeah, for, for years, you know, the Athletic asked us for our, our Stanley Cup picks, and it's like, okay, Carolina, 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 yeah. Carolina and it never happens. And, you know, they, they just haven't had the success in the postseason that I think everybody hopes for. You know, look, for all we know, they could have a deal in principle, and they just don't uh, talk about it to the end of the year. But um, I, I think Alex is right. You probably just wait to see what happens here and, and let it play out. And maybe they want him back, and, and Rod doesn't want to come back. It could be any situation. What in the world – is in the universe <laughs> is happening in freaking Columbus, Ohio, Yikes. with that friggin' team. You know what? You can feel as down if you want to be a Debbie Downer about the Blues. You just compare A B with what in the disaster that's going on in Columbus from the Babcock situation to the benching of Johnny Hockey and and Laline to now this goalie situation who's demanded a trade. So let me get this right. So about Maybe a month ago, he leaves a game early against Toronto saying that he's sick, all right? Then the team comes out and says that they want to give their third-string guy, who's a prospect, a good run to, mm-hmm. to see what he can do. So this, so their starter, outside of, I think he started two nights ago, he has been the starter once and then the backup once. What in the hell is going on here, and at what point is the owner going to go, this is a nightmare. We look like absolute clowns and absolutely blow it up. I, the, I'll go to JR first. We're talking because, about Merzlikens. Yeah, you, you you covered Yarmo like when he was the scouting director with the Blues before he went to Columbus. I, that's the part that surprises me because Yarmo was incredible at evaluating talent and getting the best out of those players that they drafted. But it seems being in the front office has not gone that same direction. Yeah, it, ju- it just hasn't worked for Yarmo and JD in Columbus. I mean, they every year they get a decent I pick. I forgot JD's there too. They get a yeah, he came back after the stint in New York mm-hmm. ended and 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 you know, they get a good pick and Yarmo's obviously good at the drafting and they found some good players. They get another one in Fantilli. Yeah. And, and, but on the ice for whatever reason, whether it's the free agents or the coaches, it could be the coaches like they've yeah. had a run of coaches and then they had the whole Babcock episode. Like you said, it just seems like every, everything seems to backfire with what Yarmo. I got a, a lot of respect for those yep. guys, but if you look big picture, it just hasn't gotten done there. And and uh, man, if, other than the upset win over Tampa and, and <laughs> the was playoffs, it. like if you were to write a book about the Columbus Blue Jackets playoff history in 20 years, yeah. it'd be empty. And that like was it, because of their goaltender that's not on their team right yeah. now. They traded him away after that playoff run. They traded him to Florida. So like, uh, the Babcock thing's really weird, but like some of the roster decisions they made were weird too. Like trade the, signing Johnny Goudreau, which like when Johnny Goudreau says he wants to come to Columbus, it makes him, right? sense. Yeah. But like it wasn't matching the identity that they were trying to accomplish with that team. I mean, Boone Jenner was an alternate captain. They had a gritty, grinded out style, and then you brought that in. But prior to Johnny Hockey, you had Patrick Line. Like you traded for Patrick Line. That one didn't make sense either. So I. I don't know if it's coaching roster players, but what it seems like they're in the situation with now is, man, they're already in a rebuild, and now they got to like rebuild the rebuild because some of the players that they're hoping can be successful are going to be out of their prime by the time some of these other. The last time Columbus was decent was John Tortorella. Like that's how long it's been since Columbus has been at that level. All right, so if you are rebooting things there, 
are you trying to move on from Johnny Hockey and from Lalene and building around Fantilli? I think Goudreau has a no movement clause, doesn't he? Yeah, plus which would make sense. Eighty yeah. more years left. Yeah, right. Nobody's right. signing that. Yeah. Wow. And then Line has got a no movement clause, or at least a modified no movement clause, I believe. So like. I think you're stuck unless you're buying out, but no, I guess you can't buy out because no movement clauses. Well, maybe I, can I, underst- I can understand the no movement clauses. Maybe I just enjoy this because it's not the Blues. Yeah. I, I think that that actually it makes sense, right? That, that actually might be it's it more than anything. You could point and be like, "Yeah, but I'm not as bad as that guy, <laughs> <laughs> right? right. Yeah, it sucks here, but it doesn't suck as bad as that." That's what Alex does on the podcast. I'm not as bad as this guy. I'm not as bad as that guy. <laughs> but I'm pointing at myself. So, gentlemen, um, I was. Um, you know, uh, much like most weeks uh, today, I didn't think that I had anything to bring to the table. Well, I got to tell you, I'm, I, I feel pretty good about it. I feel good about what I brought to the table, but you guys did carry the show. No, I will say that. JR did. JR, yeah. It always does. Kind of does. Yeah. All, right. All right, gentlemen, thank you so very much. And everybody, thank you so very much for listening for our homies, Jamie Rivers and Jeff Burton. It is Alex Ferrario. It's Jeremy Rutherford. It's Donnie Fandango. Thank you for listening. And let's go, Blues. The Last Minute Blues Podcast. Hear more at 1057thepoint.com.